This is the E of uh, real estate. My name is uh, René Stevens, and I'm very honored to have today as guest uh, Dr. Uh, Ibrahim Karim from Cairo. Welcome. Dr. Uh, Ibrahim Karim is a uh, truly uh, Renaissance man who uh, combines uh, science and spirituality in a uh, daily applicable way. And uh, he was born in Cairo. He studied uh, architecture at the famous uh, Technical University uh, in uh, Zurich, Switzerland, where he got his uh, master degree in architecture and also his doctor degree in uh, architecture and uh, uh, town planning. He also obtained a PhD in uh, tourist planning. For many years, uh, Dr. Karim uh, held uh, several advisory positions uh, in Egypt to the ministers of uh, health, culture, tourism, uh, and also of scientific uh, research. Besides uh, architecture, he uh, practiced also interior design and uh, furniture, uh, and, as, uh, and also a product design with uh, a new environmental worldview. And we will come into that uh, later. He is a uh, founder of uh, biogeometry, uh, the science of subtle energy quality in a new paradigm in architecture and industrial design and to restore harmony to our modern uh, technology environments. He is a holder of uh, numerous patents and uh, intellectual property uh, registrations in the field of uh, biogeometry. He uh, teaches and uh, supervises uh, postgraduate studies on the applications of the science of biogeometry in uh, different fields of architecture, urban and tourist planning, landscape design, industrial design, textile and fashion design, and even animal farming and agriculture. He wrote uh, two uh, English books, uh, Back to a Future to Mankind, um, that is also translated in Chinese and Italian, and as I understood, five more languages are upcoming. And the other uh, important book in English language is uh, Biogeometry Signatures. Harmonizing the bodies, subtle energies, exchange with the environment. And he's also working on several new books. Maybe you can uh, elaborate a little bit on that later on. Uh, Dr. Karim's worldview combines science and spirituality uh, in a new, unified, harmonious worldview. And that is based on a new multidimensional uh, physics of quality, actually, a science that he developed himself. The practicality of his worldview has been demonstrated in the environmental solutions that uh, biogeometry provides in many areas of life. And we will come to that uh, in this interview. Uh, so, Ibrahim, a very impressive CV, and this is only a short version. <laughs> uh, I'm really, really grateful to have you on uh, our show. Uh, welcome. Well, hello, Rene. It's a pleasure being with you. And... Uh, Thank you for this uh, long CV. <laughs> you didn't need to go so much into it. <laughs> oh, well, uh, what I read about you and what I saw on YouTube, uh, you really deserve this. Uh, you, uh, uh, thank you, René. You will come into that uh, in this interview. It's really amazing. Uh, I'm an architect myself, as you know, so uh, I recognize many, many things that you are doing. And for me, it's uh, uh, eye-opening that, uh, wow, you can combine it in one system. Uh, this is really, really uh, something. Uh, it took you, uh, uh, as I understood, about uh, 45 years to uh, uh, do this uh, odyssey into uncharted territory of uh, harmonizing and balancing resonance in the uh, environment and the humans, uh, animals, and plants in it. And in this podcast, uh, I would like to focus on the application of biogeometry in the learn and work environment. So in universities, uh, uh, as a resonance in action. And how can rethinking of a university campus have a positive impact on study outcomes and the user experience? Uh, and how can a learning environment, and in my definition, that uh, consists of three parts. So there's the physical part, so the building, the, the location, and the, the rooms in the building. Uh, but also the digital part, so the digital work environment, the digital workplace, uh, and all the Wi-Fi and all the things that go with it. And uh, last but not least, the social part. So 
also we human beings uh, have an etheric field and influence each other and are influenced by the other two environment uh, components. I read some amazing stuff uh, about your work. Uh, you are recognized and honored by several institutions uh, for your work in the environment. And uh, one of the most uh, outstanding ones is uh, your work in Switzerland, in uh, Hamburg and uh, uh, Hirschberg. Um, and they even uh, ch uh, choose you as the, uh, the man of the year by the magazine. Oh, yes, you found that? <laughs> yeah, 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 I found that. And, um, and, and I and even uh, saw that they gave you a, a nickname, Straleman, uh, in English, something yes. like uh, Radiation Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> amazing. And uh, the citizens of these two towns uh, in Switzerland, they uh, perceived uh, your interventions as miracles. And the article called you for that uh, Karim from Wonderland uh, or from uh, <laughs> yes. Miracle Land. I see you, you read the, some of the articles as well. Oh, yeah, all of them. All of them. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, them, uh, those that I could find, I read. Uh, really amazing. Because it's a hot topic, 5G and uh, in specific, but uh, electrosmog and uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation as uh, a total uh, area. I'm wondering, uh, Karim, what got you into this field of uh, creating so-called miracles? Well, uh, let me start from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I will quote uh, in, in an English translation two lines from uh, one of the Sufi poets called Omar Khayyam. And uh, those lines, I can sum them up in two lines. It says, the divine finger that writes and having writ, nor all thy piety, nor all thy wit, shall change a single word of it. Uh, now he is speaking about the divine finger, writing and drawing all the shapes in nature and everything that exists uh, and will exist. So, well, I look at those lines and then I ask myself, uh, if we are living in a country that speaks only English, or let's say in Finland you're speaking only Finnish, and you couldn't speak the language of the country, mm -hmm. you'd be pretty useless in the society if you don't speak their language. So imagine we are living in nature and there's a divine pen writing and drawing all those shapes in nature, all those nice trees and forests and even animals and every, every, all the nice things in nature, it's the writing of a divine pen. And nobody reads, we cannot read. Mm. So we are living in nature and cannot read the language of nature. What we are doing is we are speaking to ourselves. Human is speaking to human. That's the only language we understand. And you cannot live in an environment without understanding its language. So by geometry is a new science that strives to, uh, to let's say, to understand the language of nature and the forming process in nature, how nature forms things. So, in order to understand that, let's take the word biogeometry. Uh, geometry is geo and metri. Metri means measurement. And geo means the earth. So, geometry is the measurement of the earth. The word comes from the ancient Egyptians that they used to measure or survey the land every year after the flood of the Nile when the nice silt came and covered uh, all the land and when the Nile receded the water receded you had to divide the parcels again so that every farmer gets back his parcels so they surveyed every parcel from uh, I mean, Upper Egypt to Lower Egypt, that's more than a, a thousand kilometers. Every parcel on the Nile, they used to survey it. And 
that means measuring measurements in the land. And from that, we know, for, for example, the Pythagorean triangle, the triangle of 90 degrees, three, four, and five. They got a rope in those dimensions in order to get the exact 90 degrees for every parcel. So they called Egypt, one of the names for Egypt is the surveyed land. Mm. Now, so that is the meaning of geometry, is surveying of the earth. Now, I added bio to it because I didn't want just to measure the earth. No, I look at the earth like a living uh, entity. The earth is alive, is alive, and this life, we refer to it as bio. Bio means the energy of life, the life force. So I added bio to geometry in order to have a science that deals with the life force of this planet we are in, of which we are also part because the planet is a living entity. And we are like bacteria within the, this living entity. We don't live on the earth, we live in the earth because the atmosphere is part of the earth. So we live in the earth. Now, like any cells that live in a larger body, the uh, bioenergy or the life force of our systems is actually the life force of the earth. So we are like a drop in the ocean that gets its water from the ocean. We shouldn't think that the drop is separate from the ocean. Mm -hmm. And starting with this, we understood now that if we are part of the earth, we are part of the environment, then we should at least understand the language of, the, of nature. And from there, we started uh, developing biogeometry and to understand the language of nature, nature creates living things. Everything in nature is alive. Everything in nature has life force in it, has this bio force in it. And we are also parts of nature, the design of the human body and every other species. We have the life force in us. Yet we come and in our great civilization, we start producing products and putting them out in nature that do not have life force in them. And that's a big problem. We are polluting nature with things that are not alive. Mm. And we think, well, we are trying to reach life through artificial intelligence, for example. Now, you can try to simulate life through artificial intelligence, but you will never create it. And even if you reach the best computers in the world with artificial intelligence, they will become self-developing in such a way that they will not need us. And then they will take their decisions, and when they take their decisions, we will notice that they only simulate life, but they are not alive because they will not have any conscience. They will not really do things according to conscience. They will actually do things according to what is most efficient. So computers running the earth, if they think that uh, reducing humanity by a third, for example, would be good for the rest of humanity, then, and they think that's the, <laughs> the best solution, they will go and do it. They have no conscience. Mm -hmm. So understanding that, you understand you cannot create life. Well, what do you do? How does nature do it? Nature accesses life from a higher dimension. You see, life exists as a life force and all the shapes that you find in nature are governed from a higher level through certain uh, patterns, templates that come into the physical dimension through vortices or 
centers, centers of energy that come into the physical dimension and in them we have all the laws of nature that govern the evolution and growth of everything in nature. So nature brings life into matter. It accesses life into matter. Life is out there. It's, it's, you know, when we say we want to make life through artificial intelligence, it's like, imagine a fish wanting to make water. I mean, it's already living in water. Mm. What, what's a fish trying to make water? Now, we are trying to make life. We are living in a sea of life. The whole universe is based in a living background, a living force. Mm -hmm. So designing should be made like the forming process of nature. We should design our things in order to access and contain this life force. Uh, this seems a bit strange to think about how can, can we design something and make it connect to life force. Well, the first thing, let us look at the human body, for example. The human body is a container and every container should be shaped in order to contain what's in it. So you can make a container that is shaped, uh, for example, to contain water or food. So you make it in a sort of a concave like this thing to contain things in it. But what if you want to contain subtle energy levels, like life force, like emotional, like mental levels? Mm -hmm. If you want to contain those levels, you cannot use physical means to contain subtle energy levels. The only way to contain them is through resonance, entering into resonance with them and resonance between any two vibrations or any two fields will actually make a copy of every field in both of them. So to contain them, you contain them, you bring them into the system through resonance. Now, how does this resonance occur? Mm -hmm. Through the shape of the human body. The human body is shaped in every detail in order to contain all the levels of all the functions it should uh, have. And we make very interesting experiments to prove that. We bring a wooden statue, you know, the wooden artist statues. We bring a wooden statue like that, and we take the wooden statue and position the hands in different positions, and we can actually, on the statue that has a human shape, you can find the energy centers, you know, that we call the chakras. The chakras can be found on a statue, but then, the question is, if the statue displays chakras that we can measure, then it, it must have life force in it. How can a statue have life force? Mm -hmm. It has life force through shape. Now, the, on the physical level, the statue will not move, will not grow, but it carries the whole life force that it can transmit to a human. And if we understand that, we will understand the secret behind many of the ancient statues that were designed in such a way to access the life force and transmit it. That is why ancient Egyptian statues, for example, have a stylized shape, because the stylized shapes, they are very near to the perfect templates from the archetypal level. So they get those templates and even if they try to put the fairest features in it, they keep that within the minimum in order not to distort the stylized, uh, let's say, form of the statue. And those statues actually get the life force and transmit it to the community. So life force can be accessed even through dead matter or seemingly dead matter. Now, looking at that, so we want a science that brings life force into uh, whatever the human being produces. If we look at those ancient statues, 
we will find that they were placed on certain sacred power spots. And those sacred power spots has a sort of a vortex that connects the earth and higher dimensions. Now, if we go back to the beginning of humanity, we find that since the dawn of humanity, they looked at the animals and the animals have a way of finding the sacred power spots. Pigeons, for example, they, they fly in a V-shape formation and on a sacred power spot, they start turning circles and then after that, they continue in their V formation. So you know that now they're on a sacred power spot. Now, those power spots were strong energy power spots. The word sacred comes, it's humanity that looks at them, that makes them sacred for humanity. Now, how do they make them sacred? They watch the animals interact with those power spots. Those sacred power spots have underground water streams crossing at certain angles that produce a stream coming out of the earth and the water in this stream stays fresh forever. It doesn't salinate with time. It stays fresh and it has healing properties in those spots. The crossing of angles actually produces a vortex. When two lines cross at, a, at, at their crossing point, they produce a vortex in this area and then you have a sacred power spot. Now, in those sacred power spots, early humans, they were like animals. They used to go there like the animals did. And in the sacred power spots, they found that there is some multidimensional communications to higher levels. They found that maybe oracles or light beings like angels, things like that started to connect with them in those areas. So that means those areas be became areas of illumination. At the same time, they became areas of healing. And since they connected to higher uh, dimensions, those areas also became areas of burial. So to the first humans, the sacred power spot became the most important factor in the whole history of humanity is the sacred power spot from the beginning. Because after that, they used to uh, plan cities according to sacred power spots. Throughout history, sacred power spots played an important role in beliefs, in religions, and all that. Now, what did they do with the first power spot? They found that the energy of this power spot is so important in their lives, and it gives them this communication and health and all that, that they wanted to amplify it. They found that the first uh, small granite stones, let's say very dense stones, radiated more of this energy than soft stones or, or mud. So they went to a lot of trouble, getting big, big boulders, megalithic, maybe 40 ton stones from faraway places. They quarried them from mountains, put them on sledges and brought them all the way, sometimes two, 300 kilometers. And uh, in Egypt, it was 500 kilometers bringing granite shapes from the south uh, to the north. And then they erected those big megalithic stones on the power spots. That's what we call menhirs today. So menhirs are here to mark a power spot, but at the same time to radiate its energy uh, in the environment. If we look at the simple erection of a man here, we can say this is actually the beginning of true architecture. Because imagine, first you identify a stone, that means material knowledge. But material knowledge even deeper than what we have today because material knowledge in relation, in relation to subtle energy. Now, you have material knowledge and then you go and quarry the stone from a mountain or something. So you have quarrying the material. Then you take this huge 40 ton stone, you cut trees and make rollers or, or sledges, put the stone on it and keep rolling it on the land till you come to a river. You take those same trees, make a raft, and put it on the raft till you reach the nearest spot to your 
uh, area of the power spot. Then you take it again on land and you take it there and then you make a hole and then erect a 40 ton stone, imagine, you erect it so that it falls into the hole and then you have the men here. So if you take all that, it is material knowledge, it's erection, it's knowledge. You can say this is really the beginning of architecture. Now, this concept developed later in ancient Egypt as the obelisk. Now, they found that by bringing certain dimensions and certain shapes, they could amplify the energy even more. But there's always the same thing. It had to be on a sacred power spot to radiate that energy. So when they built the archetypal statues that we spoke about earlier, they always placed them on such uh, spots that had this energy, this energy connecting the earth to the sky, that means the life force. So what the monuments became full of life force that they accessed. Now, a bit later, they built two of those megalithic stones and put one on it in the shape of an arc, you know, an archway. And then, strangely enough, all of the archways are oriented towards the east, so east-west. So I kept measuring this shape, what shape of an arc. If I turn it east-west, I found that in the east-west direction, it seems to radiate uh, along the direction all the way to the east horizon, all the way to the west horizon, opens a path of radiation. So when they put those stones on the sacred power spot, they radiated the energy of the power spot to reach the rising and the setting of the sun. That means they connected the sacred energy to the life cycle, you know, of the earth. Now this meg megalithic gate, later they covered it with mud to make it like a hill on it, which later became a pyramid. So the essence of a pyramid is actually this chamber, this holy of holies, had to be in granite, had to be oriented towards the east. That's the essence of all basilicas, of all temples, of all things throughout history. It was actually this interaction with the sacred power spots. So I started thinking, okay, first of all, I need to understand uh, as a professor of architecture teaching the history of architecture, we keep teaching the material aspects, the style, you know, the Gothic style, the Romanesque style, and we keep teaching this aspect and the social aspects, the material aspects and all that. But we don't have uh, an idea about why is this church or this temple placed in this spot. If we dig deeper beside the spot, maybe 10 meters deeper, we find traces of an ancient building, of an older civilization. We go another 10 meters, we find another building from an older civilization. So it seems through maybe five, 6,000 years of history, humanity was building always on the same spot, on the same spot. Okay, so now, if we look at this ancient gate that we call Dolmen, this has become the Holy of Holies. And actually, this relationship of the Dolmen to the sacred power spots is the essence and the core of all sacred buildings. So when you look for, uh, at the pyramids, people think, start discussing, when was it built? How was it built? Okay, that's very interesting. When was it built? How was it built? But maybe the pyramid you see in front of you is the last stage mm. of humanity interacting with that spot for maybe 10,000 years earlier. That's why you find maybe in the rock bed under the pyramid, you find chambers that are carved in the rock. Maybe those chambers were done 10,000 years ago. We don't know. So 
the most important thing to know is the energy of the spots. That was the whole key in ancient civilizations is interacting with this multidimensional gateway that took you to other dimensions. So the human being here lived in connection with the higher dimensions so that all his actions and all his doings were full of life force. He connected to the life force. And this resonates with the body that has the chakras that also has those vortices in every chakra that connects to the life force. So the whole idea was bringing the full life force into whatever humanity did. So the buildings or the products of humanity, whatever it was, they were actually accessing life force. Now, in biogeometry, I thought now, how was this, I mean, what, how was this energy achieved somehow, or how was this vortex achieved? Is through angles of underwater streams. But I also knew from other studies that angles of underwater streams can make areas that produce cancer and things like that, so it could be harmful areas. So underwater stream crossings could cause cancer or could cause a very healthy uh, connection to higher dimensions. So I thought, what, where was the key? So I thought the key was polarity and angles. Mm -hmm. And if the key here is polarity and angles, that comes right in our domains, yours and mine as architects, yes. you know. Yes, indeed. It, yes. it comes right in our lab. So I said here there must be a geometrical language that has to do with this. Now, first, I used some ancient sciences, I put them together to make a physics of quality that I could use to measure the quality of sacred power spots. So I studied Pythagorean harmonics, you know, harmonics of string harmonics, and I studied uh, different forms of scientific forms of dowsing that you used certain wavelengths of dowsing or wavelengths on strings. And then I combined universal harmonics with this dowsing. And in universal harmonics, I extended, imagine a musical instrument where every string is in resonance with one double or half its size. Imagine if I take this musical instrument and I extend it from one side to zero and from the other side to infinity. That means everything in existence it become one harmonic unity, will become connected in quality. So a science of quality can actually connect with everything in existence. So now I started using this science of quality to understand what are the qualities of the energy in sacred power spots. When I was able to determine that, I started developing a geometrical language that would reproduce the same quality as sacred power spots. Now I started developing the geometrical language. Once I got it, that I could reproduce that energy through angles and shapes. Because you know, you know that when light goes through a prism, mm -hmm. it uh, refracts in angles and every angle is a color. So in a prism, you see the relationship between angles and qualities. So actually, uh, angles are the components of shape. So you can say that shapes are frozen qualities anyhow. So shapes in nature are qualities. If they are connected to the sacred energy, they become living qualities. Mm -hmm. So in, in the example of the prism, uh, you say uh, the, has different uh, qualities. Uh, actually, this, yes. the uh, colors have different qualities. And as we know, colors have uh, different uh, wavelength. So in that yes, way, you every can wavelength, them. every wavelength breaks down in a different angle. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And when it breaks down in a different angle, now our brain 
when it sees the angles and the frequencies, it transforms the angles in the visual center in the brain into colors. And then you see the colors. So the colors are the brain's reaction to the angles. So actually, we could say that, uh, that every shape is radiating all kinds of colors, but it's on a, since it's not like sound, sound has many octaves. Colors is only one octaves. So shape radiates colors, but on other octaves that we don't see. Mm -hmm. But now, since we managed to find the language of shape that reproduces the energy of sacred power spots, then we can actually use shapes to amplify that energy. We can use shapes to store that energy or to radiate that energy. So now, sacred energy quality becomes usable as we use energy in a quantitative way. So imagine now you can store qualities, you can radiate qualities, you can use them. Uh, imagine a future where your fuel was qualities. Mm -hmm. So now we have this language. We are now, we have achieved a very important step that we can actually reproduce the energy of a power spot away from a power spot. So we become free because let's say I want to build a house. Not every house, like a temple, uh, I can choose a power spot to build it upon. Mm -hmm. But now with the biogeometry language, I can create my own power spot. If I design a chair, I create the chair has its own vortex, it's connected. So in a way, biogeometry is a language that produces shapes that access the life force. So now we are imitating the language of nature. We're creating living forces. Now, why is that of great importance today? Now, elect electrosmog coming from the radiation that we have, you know, electromagnetic radiation of uh, is filling the whole atmosphere because we're in the age of information. Now, unfortunately, uh, electromagnetic radiation has a dehydrating quality. It has a similar dehydrating quality that you find in ancient tombs and pyramids and all that. The same dehydrating quality exists in electricity. Now, dehydrating quality means what? Life force is in water. And when systems lose water through dehydration, they lose life force. When they lose life force, they lose immunity. Their immunity is reduced. So the age of information is actually reducing the immunity of all life species, of all life on Earth. Now, when you go to plants and trees and all that, and the immunity is reduced, uh, the parasites increase because the trees don't, can't defend themselves anymore. The parasites increase. As a result, you start using more chemicals. So instead of just having electromagnetic pollution, now you have electromagnetic pollution and chemical pollution. Yeah. See? So now we have to restore the life force, the lost life force in our civilization. Otherwise, with the increase of electromagnetic radiation, we have a hidden time bomb in the age of information that one day you, you, immune systems of life will collapse and the whole civilization is finished and maybe a new species, new humanity start in the future. But we are in real danger of because we do not want to address the problems of electromagnetic radiation. That no, I, when, I, when I may uh, interrupt you uh, for, yes, please do. Uh, for a second, uh, you could say that um, it is like the boiling frog syndrome. So uh, yes. most of us are not aware that, that the water is uh, warming up uh, to a degree yes. that they cannot handle it anymore. And when we figure that out, it's too late. Uh, 
So luckily, yeah, uh, people like you uh, are, are making us aware that uh, that not only this is going on, but also that there is a solution for it. Yes, and not only that, if we look at electromagnetic radiation, it's not only dehydrating life systems, it is actually contributing to global warming. Because when, if any wave moves, any motion like that produces heat, you know, motion, motion is heat. Like in a microwave, you heat your water in a microwave. So why are, not, are we not aware that all those electromagnetic waves in the atmosphere are actually contributing to heat? So we do not want to see that our civilization is contributing to global warming and going from fossil fuels to electricity is not solving anything. No, no. Unless we have a science like biogeometry, mm. we are actually making things worse. Mm. So if you're sitting in a car and you're sitting on a stack of batteries, with time, you will feel the difference in your health. Mm. Or if you're in a city that everything is run ele ele electrically. I mean, every day today we have 100 new inventions. We keep increasing all kinds of electromagnetic radiation on Earth. Now already 5G is causing problems. So we should, we cannot stop that. And since we cannot stop it, we have a science like biogeometry that can actually take the energy, the harmonizing energy from higher dimension, the life force, and actually put it into electromagnetic radiation, putting it into the atmosphere. So at the end, you have a healing energy in the atmosphere. You have electromagnetic radiation like it carries pictures, sounds, and all that. Why not make it carry a healing spiritual energy full of life force mm -hmm. that actually our age of information would be increasing the life force of the earth instead of depleting it. Yeah. And that is what biogeometry is doing. It wants to bring back the life force into all designs of humanity, into all its products. So in this way, we are actually following the principles of the forming process in nature. So we become part of nature, the human being, and all what he is doing becomes in harmony with the nature he is living in. Mm -hmm. And all what I'm saying now seems, uh, you could think that it's, I'm not just philosophizing or saying things like that. From the first day we started by geometry, maybe over, now it's about 47, 48 years ago. From the first day, we were providing solutions to problems that cannot be solved otherwise. When we did the electrosmog problems in Switzerland, when I went to Hamburg, the government asked me to solve the problem because the people were demonstrating and they wanted to dynamite the towers, the mobile towers. So I asked them first, uh, do you have a solution in mainstream science? Like you said before, I come from the eight and a half from Zurich. Yeah. So they know me there. Um, they look at me as a Swiss scientist. So, uh, okay. Do we have in mainstream science a solution? And they said, no. If we had a solution, we wouldn't ask you to come. <laughs> okay. I said, okay, now. You want to cancel the effect of electromagnetic radiation on people. Well, I can tell you a very simple uh, answer to that. Take away the cause that's causing yeah. the effect. <laughs> they said, we didn't bring you to tell us that. We know that, but we want you to cancel the effect without uh, taking away uh, the cause, without taking away all the electro electric sources or magnetic sources. So I told them, is that logic? <laughs> you know, I play with them a bit. And yeah. so they said, Ibrahim, we know you can do it in biogeometry, so please find a solution. So I said, okay. So now, when we installed our geometrical shapes, 
some very strange things happened, you know. Uh, 60% of all health symptoms, according to the study that uh, Dr. Uh, Yvonne Gili from the parliament and Bosco Bueller, another member of parliament, they did the study, the independent study. They found that 60% of health problems were reduced. Uh, things like epilepsy, for example, vanished completely from the area. Be many children had epilepsy, it vanished. Now, besides that, they found that the community had changed on the emotional, mental level. Because on a television program, when they were speaking about all, they were speaking about the miracle of Hamburg, look at all what happened to the cows, migrating birds came back, the cows are now fertile again, the milk production is here, plants are okay, uh, the people are healthier. So they call that the miracle of Hamburg. The mayor came out and said, well, I would like to say something, but on a different scale than what you are saying. I'm speaking as the mayor of, of the community. I thank Dr. Karim for bringing peace to my community and for bringing back the church into our hearts. Now, why was that? Because when they did the first questionnaire, people sometimes said things uh, that were not in the questionnaire. Like, for example, I am not enjoying life. People didn't have any problems, no monetary problems, no financial problems, nothing. Everything was perfect in their lives, but they didn't enjoy life. They had no taste for life. Or they said, I have no will. Or the people were aggressive with each other. You know, your dog go, goes into the neighbor's garden, there's a fight. They, they're aggressive. People in the streets were very aggressive with each other. Even in the homes, couples were fighting all the time. And so there was a lot of aggression going around. Now, with Bajomti, all of a sudden, everything calmed down. And they found people walking in the streets, smiling at each other. Uh, the aggression had left the people. And when they came 10 days later and asked the same question to the people, they were astonished because the person would say, now I'm enjoying life. So they tell him, are you crazy? Last week you said mm. <laughs> you didn't enjoy it. He said, no, but now I'm enjoying it. <laughs> How come now? He says like that. After Ibrahim came, now I'm enjoying life. And they noticed that all the people in those areas started calling me always by my first name. You know, in Switzerland, we always use family names. They use Dr. Karim or Mr. Karim. We always use family names in Europe. But those people there, they got so close to me that they are always referring me Ibrahim and laughing and joking and things like that. So the mayor, he looked at the people in the community and he found it very strange. Why are those people so happy? <laughs> uh, it's peaceful, enjoying things. And that's what he said on TV. Something had changed. One year later, we had a conference in Hamburg. And the people came and said, look, Ibrahim, we have the right to know the type of energy you are using. So I said, well, I explained everything. So they said, yes, you explained everything like an engineer, very scientific, <laughs> very good. But there's something more that you didn't explain. Are you afraid that uh, somebody would say he's using some kind of spiritual energy or things like that? why don't you tell us the truth? What kind of energy quality are you using? Because we know it is spiritual because everything changed here. We live in a different dimensions. So tell us it's our right to know when you use energy with us, it's our right to know. So I told them, yes, I explained to them, this is the energy of sacred parsbos and all that. And so they understood by geometry. And actually the people of Hamburg, when I was asked to make the second area in Hirschberg, because in Hamburg we placed all the geometrical shapes, we placed them on uh, facing the mobile towers. 
and uh, the ships we used their ships you know ships like this like i have in the screen like this uh -huh. ships like this that emit energy so they were emitting energy towards the towers so they wanted to make a solution for all of switzerland a total country solution but they said if we go in every place and put the ships pointing to the towers uh, maybe people will understand or will say that mobile energy is harmful mm. and ibrahim is correcting it yeah 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 so can you please find another way of doing it because if we make a total country project uh, don't use the towers so i said okay i'm this energy instead of using hundreds of shapes in the towers it was easier for me to carry this quality on the emanation of the mobile uh, towers so i can use less shapes yeah, yeah. otherwise it as, to, as carrier wave uh... as, as a carrier thing yeah so they told me find another carrier thing i told them okay i can use the energy of the earth the earth itself can carry those waves so we went in hirschberg and there's a central hill like that called Hirschberg, and then the whole valley of Appenzell, it goes, it's a radius of 10 kilometers uh, all around with mountains at the end. So we went to the central spot and got the 12 big shapes like that, put them in plastic tubes, and put the plastic tubes in the ground. We filled them with water first. To, to get the energy of life in there. And we buried them in the ground. We buried the 12 of them in the ground in this central spot. Mm. And it actually harmonized the whole valley from inside the earth. And that was the pilot project for the total Swiss solution. Well, we, we negotiated after that a contract for the total Swiss solution, but uh, some a lot of political uh, uh, problems came into there and all that. And I had at that time, I left for Canada. Uh, I m migrated to Canada. And so we didn't complete uh, the total Swiss solution. But we had the prototype for it uh, was done. Now, the good thing about biogeometry is it combines the aspect of harmony coming from spirituality into the aspect of practicality. So, you know, when you speak about science, science is practical. You have to practical applications. Spirituality is not practical. So to make both one, spirituality becomes practical. Science accesses life force. So both of them meet and there is no bridging science and spirituality because they're already one okay and that this kind of science is the science of universal harmonics that the ancients used uh, in their great civilizations and so we we now have after uh, giving this long introduction we now have a design language that we can actually uh, use in all fields of life I mean, until today, for the past 20 years, I've been supervising uh, postgraduate works uh, in many universities where we have all the laboratories doing our research and that. In all design fields you can think of, from town planning to architecture to furniture design to product design, even mm -hmm. textile design mm -hmm. or uh, clothes design, uh, whatever you can th think of landscape design for years. and. Uh, we have done a lot of work on the human brain, how we can actually create shapes that restore the chemical balance in the human brain. We have one uh, doctor's degree where they tested on mice. Uh, uh, they tested how geometrical shape can restore the serotonin level in the brain of depressed mice. They we couldn't work on human beings because we started by the student of mine went to one of the centers we put a few shapes in one of the rooms and we asked as a comparison 
that the patient in that room who had some form of the depression not be given uh, any drugs in order to compare the effect of geometry with the effect of the other rooms where they gave them drugs. But we found that uh, no center accepted uh, to have a patient without giving him drugs. So when faced with this, we said, okay, uh, maybe it's even better if we ask the university uh, to make animal testing because we would also overcome the placebo effect when you work yeah. on animals. Yeah, exactly. And as a result, we got the results. We raised the serotonin level. This, it's usually never 100 units. It's about 80 like that because we have a, a lot of environmental pollution. So it's usually 80 uh, levels in humans and animals. And when depressed, uh, it goes down to maybe 30, something like that. So they made four groups. Three of the groups were given the popular antidepressant drugs. And one group was put in a, an area where you had a biogeometry shape. And they actually, the biogeometry shape got the best results. Only one other drug was on the same level as biogeometry. The two other drugs were much less. And so we showed that with architecture or design, you could restore the chemical balance in the brain. And in the meantime, we have done architectural shapes uh, that like pavilions. I have one in my office in the garden. I have a pavilion and that was a prototype for a large project, the classroom of a large project. And in this pavilion, you bring in autistic children, ADHD, all problems, uh, problematic children, and what happens when they go in there, their perception starts to become normal. The pressure goes away, and they start becoming normal like people, and their parents would sit there and cry when they see the child changing his action and perception, or hyperactive child sitting and enjoying praying and drawing and doing things like that. And so we have shown that you can use architecture actually to change the or to restore the well-balance of the chemicals in the brain. We have carpets that do that. We have all kinds of designs. We have chairs, uh, trays, and all kinds of things. Now, all our products have the same criteria. Since they bring in the life force, access it, and put it in whatever you use it, and the human being interacts with it, he gets the life force. And this will give you an idea about how humanity can change all its products into living products, not dead products. Yeah, yeah, that, and this that's, is very, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the main goals of biogeometry. For example, people are not aware today when they move an ancient statue or an obelisk from a sacred past, put and put it somewhere else because it's a nice place, or they move a temple uh, because they want to take it away from the water of the Nile. They are taking something that is full of life force and putting it on a dead spot, and it becomes dead. It was alive for 5,000 years, and all of a sudden, because of our stupidity, it becomes a dead uh, uh, material building. So, by geometry, is a vocation. It's a very important thing to save our humanity and give it a future. Uh, while at the same time, when you work in biogeometry, it becomes a process of initiation. Because you know, any person who works in connecting the material to the spiritual, this form of work transforms the person doing it. So it becomes a form of initiation. And oh, so we as an architect, we have a very responsible job. Uh... Yes, but you know what? In ancient times, the architects knew that their job was sacred. They knew that when they built an ancient church or a temple, they, they didn't let a worker uh, touch the stones unless he was purified 
and did certain purification rituals before he touched the stone. You know, for example, in, uh, in Spain, Antonio Gaudi, he went into fasting before he built the, the church because he felt he wasn't prepared. He had to purify himself to build it. So architects in ancient times uh, knew that architectural achievements were sort of uh, talismans of uh, initiation, where the ruler or the pharaoh, when he built a city, it was his act of initiation. When he built a pyramid, it was his act of initiation. But the way to do it was always connecting to the sacred power spot, connecting to life force. When you build a city, you have four or five or ten sacred power spots. You go on those sacred power spots and put your important buildings on them, and then you connect the sacred power spots with the main avenues. So now you have this sacred energy flowing in your whole city, and from the main avenues you go to the, you use the earth radiation to spread it in the city. So the whole city becomes connected to the life force and becomes prosperous, becomes a yeah, prosperous that, city. That uh, brings me to some uh, uh, famous uh, uh, quotes from uh, uh, architects, um, <clears throat> like the most, the most, because you, you give it a total uh, different meaning and, and uh, a more holistic approach, like from uh, Bauhaus, uh, form follows function. Yes. Uh, oh, that's, uh, yeah, that sounds very uh, logical. Uh, uh, when you look at it, of course, it should uh, fit for the purpose, uh, this build. Uh, but it is only a snapshot in time. Uh, but you know, function, the word function, function here. So yeah, I, the I word call function can, can have many meanings. Exactly, exactly. And so uh, I um, often play with the words and I say, yeah, actually, it's not form follows function, it is function melts form. So that it uh, stays adaptive to uh, changing processes in, uh, in those buildings. And um, Frank Lloyd Wright, the, um, uh, also the famous architect, he, uh, he called it once, uh, form and function should be one, uh, joined in a spiritual union. So that comes close to what you say. And, you see the uh, word spiritual union here gives a new dimension to function. Exactly. So function is multidimensional. Exactly, exactly. And, and, and maybe uh, uh, Vincent Churchill with his famous quote, uh, he said, first we build our uh, uh, buildings and thereafter they, uh, or first we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, um, so all of them, they had the feeling that form uh, has a, an important role, uh, not only uh, containing the function or making the function uh, possible, but there's a much bigger spiritual dispens uh, uh, meaning to it. Uh, as I read somewhere that uh, your quote, and you <clears throat> elaborated that already uh, very, very uh, eloquent, uh, that energy and shape create function. Yes, because if you a little bit more shape about energy, that. you know, if you shape energy, you create function. Uh, like if you have, uh, you want to cook, you bring uh, a pot, put it on the fire. The fire takes the shape of the pot so the heat can actually cook the food. And you know, using this same idea, you know, how do you, a very simple way of opening the different functions or chakras of the body, you bring a shape, a bowl shape like that and put it on every chakra of the body, like a ball shape, because the chakras like fire, it will open around the ball shape. It will like a flower. So if I take any shape that has uh, a ball like like that, hemispheric shape, I put it on every chakra. The chakra will take its shape. So, and then automatically the chakra will open before because mm. the energy you shape energy you create function. So this is a very Easy way, I take a, a teacup when I'm sitting and I put it on my head, <laughs> put it here and say, this is the lazy Egyptian way of opening the chakra, you know? Yeah, then you, heard, you hear also about uh, sound balls, that they put the balls uh, on the chakras and then make it vibrate. Yes. Even. Here you are adding sound, but yeah. actually if you put the ball on the chakra, the shape 
will open the okay. chakras straight away. So, you know, uh, this example uh, about the energy, I was uh, once speaking at an international uh, architecture conference in Alexandria, and I told them the problem of our modern architecture today, what we were missing. I told them, look, if you look at every great architecture in the world, actually the culture is different, but the process is always perfect, it's complete. So the process produces good architecture. I told them, imagine the process to be like a machine that makes sausage, you know? Mm. I tell them the process is like that. So you have one uh, a disc in it. For example, this is the disc of material. This is the disc of function. This is the disc of social aspect. So you have all the different discs in the sausage machine. One of the discs is subtle energy of the earth. This is also one of the discs. Now, you put whatever kind of meat you put here, you get the perfect sausage here because all the discs in there. I tell them, well, what happened is the boy cleaning the machine, while he opened it to clean it, the disc of energy of the earth fell out. He didn't notice it, it fell under the table, so he cleaned the machine and closed it. And then we came in our modern times and used that machine, not knowing that a disc fell out, Mm -hmm. And we keep putting sausage on one side or meat on one side. Sausage comes out on the other side. And the sausage is never perfect. We think it's perfect, but it's ne never perfect because it's missing one of the uh, little discs in there. So I told them, that's why one day in the future, somebody will find that disc, put it back in the machine, the energy disc, and perfect the sausage machine. And you say, oh, I'm sorry, all the sausage uh, done before that was not perfect. And I tell them, if we look at this metaphor, you will understand that a future civilization will look at our great architecture and call us the dark ages of architecture. Mm -hmm. We can do fantastic things, fantastic, fantastic architecture, but without the life force, mm -hmm. We are in the dark age of architecture because every bird species knows how to make its nest in a way that the nest sort of amplifies the life force. And every species, a snail does that. Every natural species knows how to build its home to amplify and protect its energy and correct it, except humans. We make our homes today they're full of electromagnetic radiation, radioactivity, and all things like that. We have a couple of doctor's degrees where we use biogeometry to uh, cancel or reduce the effect of the radioactivity of building materials. Because people are not aware that in their homes there's radioactivity. Granite gives radioactivity. Some textiles, uh, I mean, give radioactivity. Uh, on the walls, you have paint. Some paints give radioactive uh, material. Some all kinds of ceramics sometimes give radioactivity. And we're not aware that we could be living in a radioactive environment and we think that we're safe. So it's not just electromagnetic radiation. So we have two papers uh, that have been published in peer scientific magazines in the United States. One of them about electromagnetic radiation. The other one is about this weak radioactivity of building materials. And so by geometry, I find that it is important that humanity does not lose its connection to the higher forces of life and the higher dimensions. Otherwise, humanity will lose itself. Yeah, actually, it has two uh, dimensions. Uh, the, the most important is that we as human beings should make personally that connection and not depending on uh, external things, whatever they are. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you prove that external things can help us to come in the right state and maybe uh, uh, that it takes some more time, 
but in the end we we also reach that state uh, but you know yeah. when you say we human beings should connect the ancients didn't think that connecting uh, in a practical way through doing work and objects and all that uh, was one thing and that personal connectivity through prayers and things like that was a different thing mm -hmm. no they looked at both as one you had one your actions the way every activity you did was a connection. So it combined both things into one. Okay, that brings me to your uh, uh, um, remark in the beginning that you said we are not living on the earth, we are living in the earth. In it, yes. And so we are part of it. So that uh, uh, something similar could, uh, uh, metaphor we could use that uh, a human body with all its cells we are we are these cells uh, actually we humans but there's yes. a bigger form around us so, so we think we are just that one cell uh, and now two cells are communicating with each other but actually there's a much bigger thing going on that well also I, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you another example that many people are not aware of we live from the energy of the sun now unfortunately i can't go out in the balcony in the morning open my mouth like this and feed off the energy of the sun, you know. I don't have an organ that can transform it into chemical energy and all that. I can take a bit in my skin, form vitamin D, but I cannot take it and transform it into chemical energy and to give me life force. So I'm missing an organ. Now, out there in nature, there's the plant. The plant is my missing organ. It is out there. It takes that energy, transforms it into chemical energy, and then I eat it or the animals eat it, and we get the life force from the sun. We get it in our system. So actually, the plant out there is one of my organs, mm -hmm. but it's situated outside my body. Mm -hmm. So I should look at it like that. I have organs in my body, and I have organs outside my body. Mm -hmm. So I am one. If I separate my body from the plants, I die. Yeah, yeah. So you should look at it like that. Uh, in my lectures, I like to say, I don't like to say uh, how we interact with the environment. I always say we should reach a level where I say, I am the environment. Mm -hmm. That is the reality. We are part of this. We are one with it. You see, like you said, in the body, an immune cell cannot speak of itself as if it's a separate entity, mm -hmm. forgetting that it's living inside me, you know. Mm -hmm. And now let, let's look at something uh, about our actions. If we're, since we're speaking about cells, on my hand here, there are so many little bacteria, thousands and thousands in every square inch, that it's like a community doing work. One takes care of the, this part of the skin, one takes care of that. It's a whole nation working on every square centimeter in my hand. Now, if they start to stop working and start uh, doing their own thing, their politics or whatever it is, I will find that my skin starts itching or something is happening in the skin. So what do I do if my skin itches? I scratch. Now, when I scratch, a scratch, I kill about 2,000 of those bacteria. Mm -hmm. So we should, humanity should beware because one day this great being, the earth, can scratch and we, and bye-bye humanity. You see? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, <laughs> Indeed, so uh, I think uh, an important step in this is uh, bringing awareness, uh, uh, so broaden your, our perspective and our horizon that uh, when you look at from this uh, standpoint, yeah, it gives a complete different dim dimensions uh, that uh, we are not uh, single persons doing our thing, uh, we are one uh, big uh, organism. Um, suppose I, I bring a little bit back to the topic of um, so, so more in detail, the, the application for a university campus, that's also an ecosystem in itself. You mean uh, a university campus? 
in university campus. Uh, so oh, okay. University study campus. And, and work environment. Yes. Uh, um, a, a ecosystem in itself. Um, so you are a professor yourself. You worked, uh, are still working at universities. Um, what could uh, biogeometry do to enhance the um, uh, study results of uh, students? and to enhance the health and well-being and probably even the consciousness uh, and also the people, the staff and the professors who are involved. Well, let's look at teaching to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, science, the definition of science is actually observation. Nothing more than just observation. If you see a phenomena, you just observe what are the steps that lead to that phenomena. So science is just observing the phenomena happening around you. And by observe, observing, you, you get to know things. So science is knowledge through observation. It's very simple. Now, unfortunately, we became uh, completely, let's say, in love with our modern technology. And so we changed the, the definition of science uh, into what I can measure with my instruments is science and what I cannot measure is not scientific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is a huge mistake because energy, the definition is the ability to make an effect, to produce an effect. So if I look at observation, the original concept of science, then your thoughts are energy, your feelings are energy, your actions are energy, your movements are energy. But if I'm trying to measure everything with devices that I invented, mm -hmm. and then I'm so happy with my device that whatever it cannot measure does not exist, so all of a sudden now, my device cannot measure your emotions or your, your thoughts coming out of your mind, so it is not energy, you know? Forget about it. It's humanities. So we, science, what it's doing is closing itself from nature, from the environment by doing this, by sticking to what it can measure only. Now, going to universities, I was once uh, in a think tank with one of the biggest... Uh, 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 the, the, let's say medical institutions in the world and one of the biggest universities and we're sitting there discussing and while talking a person was showing statistics about the medical department and he showed that students entering the first year of medicine uh, the students had 40% uh, of the students had knowledge about nutrition and uh, lifestyle and health. 40% of the students had good knowledge of that. Those students went in to become doctors and then specialized specialists and all that. And then when they became specialists after seven years, they did the same uh, statistical analysis and they found that only 20% now mm. had knowledge of those things. So my reaction was, after the speaker finished, I told him, I see something very dangerous now in our institutions. I see that teaching actually uh, uh, puts a barrier to knowledge. And if our university teaching puts barrier to knowledge because every department, the more you specialize, the more you push things out. It's, it's a very dangerous situation. We must make a university teaching that opens the people to observation of nature, to observation of things, to understanding, because science is observation, and not get them stuck only to what I measure and what I don't measure and all that. So. They were uh, shocked a bit when I said that. And I said, I didn't say anything. It's your statistics on, on the board. The statistics show that. Mm -hmm. 
Now, what, what we want to do uh, in a university environment, first of all, imagine that I use by geometry to build the university or to modify an existing building. Oh, yes. Yeah. see. What will happen? First, the background energy will be less stressful when people are relieved of inner stress. First of all, what happens when the environment is healthy, a lot of the chronic diseases disappear mm -hmm. because people don't know that chronic diseases that we cannot cure, we can only manage, have their cause in the environment. Like things, all the things like uh, people are getting diabetes, uh, we don't know why. You're getting high blood pressure, you don't know why. You're getting this. Many things can be managed because the cause lies out there in the environment and we're not looking for the cause. So if I make a healthy environment, you will have people there entering an environment with no stress. Yeah. With no stress, that means they are relieved, their emotional, mental aspects open. And when we put by geometry, we are connecting them to life force. So we're opening the students, besides the knowledge that they are being taught, we're opening them to experience experiential knowledge, mm -hmm. things that they can experience. And the building is helping with that in providing the energy that will make you all of a sudden creative, that will make you think, that will make you that. Because like I told you in all our uh, research, we can use by geometry to bring back the chemical balance in the brain. And this, I think, is the most important aspect in a university, is bringing the chemical balance in the brain of the people who go in this very special institution. Yeah, and this yeah. is by geometry. This is yeah. what by geometry can do. Exactly. Uh, that uh, uh, when I say the my words, uh, uh, so by uh, rebalancing and harmonizing the energy in that uh, uh, environment, that university environment, um, stress levels go down, and also the fight and flight uh, response of people go down. So they will yes. be automatically uh, because they're at ease, yeah. more open-minded. And, and more receptive, yes. Exactly. And, and that goes two ways. It's not only not the students, but also the professors and the staff. Uh, so probably something similar, as, or maybe the same, as in one of those uh, Swiss uh, uh, towns where the spirituality yes. level went up. So just by treating the environment in a university campus, that would we be... We can change all that. That would you be know, a great uh, experiment, I think, uh, when we could find... Yes, you know, in every... A university is like a big company, you know, and you will always find when the energy is a bit stressful, you will find that the interpersonal relationships of the staff together, of yes. the students together, and all that, you will always have uh, problems uh, between students, problems between staff, and all that. And if by using by geometry, we can reduce those problems. We can reduce sick leaves, for example. We can yep. reduce those things. I think that universities will become uh, utopias for the future. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I agree with that. So uh, I'm playing with the thought to uh, start a, a pilot project for this. Uh, uh, I'm uh, connect, con uh, contacting some university in the UK to do that. So uh, proof is the is the best uh, uh, argument. So just yes, yeah, it's working. So. Yeah, we don't have to, you know, we don't have to build a new campus. No, 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 if, no. Exactly. If a university is open to it, yeah, we go and transform the existing campus. Exactly. Because in biogeometry, you, you know, uh, shapes enter into resonance like musical strings. Yeah. So if you cannot modify a big shape of a building, you can put a small shape of a building in the right proportions and make it resonate with the big shape and introduce harmony in it. Exactly. So by geometry, we have many, many possibilities 
of doing such things. Yeah. And I think your idea of uh, uh, doing something with the university would be uh, really uh, opening a path to the future. Exactly, that's also my thing, because uh, who has the youth has the future, uh, so we yes. are training our youth over there, they have to take over from us uh, after some time. Yes, that, that's our And future, actually, yes. per definition, a university uh, environment should be the perfect uh, environment, because they should yes. be open-minded, because that's yes. the university. You see, it is uh, it's very simple. Uh, when you approach a university, you can make a, a research project. Mm -hmm. For example, we say, we are going to make a pilot project for three months. Exactly. Install things for three months yeah. and evaluate before and after. You exactly. know why I only say for three months and then take it off to evaluate? Because people usually, when everything becomes better, Sometimes we take it for granted. Yes, 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 yes. You know, when you feel better, you never think that there's a reason you feel better. Yeah. You take it for granted. Yeah. So uh, they will only feel the, uh, what my jump to did for them when after three months, this you gone. go and take away yes. the shapes. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I've noticed that when I did uh, especially projects in hospitals, I take the things away and they come and how come you take the things away? You know, now all the people are feeling bad again and all that. I told you. <laughs> so, you know, so it's good to put the solution yeah. and say, this is a pilot project. Yes. Then you take it away, see what happens. And yeah. then if they want a permanent solution, that's the second step. Exactly. This is the right way to convince people yeah. of what uh, Biogeometry can do. Exactly. And, and that will give, uh, I think... Uh, yeah, a huge example for other universities. Uh, probably you have the same experience with the hospitals. Uh, so when they uh, experience a difference, yeah. Yes. No well, I have the experience of with human beings in like places like Hirschberg and uh, mm -hmm. Hamburg. Of course, I have done many, many projects in the Middle East, but with governments. Uh, and these projects uh, are high security projects I cannot speak about. But we've had lots of experiences uh, with companies who had uh, uh, staff problems between the, the staff and we worked on it. So we ha have lots of experience in uh, bringing back the, the, the proper atmosphere uh, in a place. And uh, any uh, uh, new project, for example, when we speak about university, uh, the good thing is we have done so many animal farming projects. So, because animal farming projects, uh, they really, uh, uh, for example, show that there is no placebo effect. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll tell you a, 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 a nice little funny story. We were sitting in Switzerland and in a big conference about Hamburg. Uh, and the people of Hamburg were sitting there and some professors were sitting there. And then a, a professor of psychology, uh, he asked to speak. And then he said, you know, uh, all this biogeometry is nonsense because uh, there's no science behind it. Uh, this Dr. Ibrahim Karim is an Egyptian. And the Egyptians have those ancient magical sciences, you know, in their temples and all those things. Mm. And it is known that if people have a very advanced science, they can use a sort of hypnotism, but on a mass scale. Mm. And he can go into a place and everybody becomes healthy because he hypnotized everybody, everybody becomes healthy. And then he says, this is biogeometry. Biogeometry is a cover. Mm -hmm. Because I know there could exist people with these abilities and since now you say he's Egyptian so he must have abilities like that yeah uh, uh. I was sitting there and I was saying I, I won't answer I don't want to want to enter with him into a discussion but then an old lady uh, from Hamburg raised her hand 
and said, excuse me, sir, do you think that our cows speak Arabic? <laughs> <laughs> he got so embarrassed because yeah. she was saying, our cows got healthier, the plants got healthier. Yeah. It was, do you think he speaks Arabic to those? You know? yeah, and yeah. this was a funny thing, it shows that really plants and animals and all that, they are sort of, they are showing that there is no placebo effect here. Mm -hmm. And placebo effects usually, they are very strong in the beginning and then they start fading away. Uh, biogeometry effects, they start slowly and they keep increasing, increasing with time because more resonance happens, more resonance happens until they reach a state where they reached a level and this level becomes the permanent state. And this stays all the time, it doesn't change. Hamburg and Hirschberg are working now. I was there last month, I was in Hirschberg and I went there to check. They wanted me to see if everything was good with 5G and all that. And we went to check Hirschberg and Hamburg and everything was good after so many that uh, Hamburg was two, 2003, Hirschberg 2007. And they're still energetically very sound till today, even with 5G. So this is the difference between when you put an energy solution there and all sorts of, uh, mm -hmm. there's no magic, you know, in science, mm -hmm. there's no magic. Because magic is something that you do not understand. Exactly, exactly. But once you understand it, it becomes science. Yeah. It's not magic. There's no magic uh, anywhere. Yeah. The ancient Egyptians didn't use magic. Yeah. They used science. All the great ancient civilizations used science and not magic. Yeah, and um, yeah, indeed. And when you don't understand something, it is uh, sometimes fearful, and uh, yeah, you are uh, you're feeling not safe. Um, but on the other hand, uh, uh, you say, yeah, people believe in instruments when you can measure it, then it exists. When you don't measure it, can measure it, uh, it does not exist. But when people say something like this to me, I tell them, uh, do you remember last time when you uh, felt in love, or maybe you are still in love? When that happened, did you go to a doctor and ask the <laughs> doctor, please do a test because I'm not sure if I'm in love? <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm in love, yes. Nobody does that. So there are fields uh, that, that we dare to trust our feelings and, uh, and that uh, uh, those things that are not measurable. Uh, and but actually you know, a lot of important decisions are made just on that feeling. Uh, even worse. But are the science, more. proper science, should be able to address all those things and measure them. Mm -hmm. But we have to be open-minded. First, I should understand that when you are in love, something is happening. Mm -hmm. And anything that produces an effect is energy. So love is energy. So why don't I extend the borders of my science mm -hmm. to embrace all types of energy? Yes. This would take us into a science of the future. And yeah. the physics of quality in biogeometry does exactly that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would also be very, uh, uh, I think, interesting when uh, we do such a uh, pilot project in a university that some of uh, their own faculties get involved in the testing. Uh, actually, let them course, test. Of course, yes. Uh, we, we can make every faculty uh, use, according to its way of thinking, according to its possibilities, they can come into the project and we can have a multidisciplinary Exactly. Uh, that's what I'm pointing. Uh, assessment. Yes, that yeah. would be very interesting. Yeah, yes. yeah. When there are engineers and uh, sci uh, and uh, psychology and medical, uh, whatever they have, everybody can assess his own way. Yes. Exactly. And they can test it in their own environment. And um, yeah, let's see what uh, what what happens <laughs> <laughs> with yes. the awareness uh, after that. Uh, I I interviewed. Um, a, uh, a former professor in uh, London, uh, from the London University uh, in September. And uh, he said something, yeah, then there is, he did a lot of testing in, in his uh, career. He is in, into dowsing and uh, radionics. He was the 
former chairman of the Verionic Association in the UK. And uh, he said, yeah, we did a lot of testing, but there were colleagues and that was everything was probably done, scientifically proven, gold standard method, everything was okay. Uh, and they, uh, they didn't want to believe it. They just put it aside. Uh, so you have to be open-minded. Uh, you know, the, 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 the good thing about biogeometry is I don't ask people to believe. I just ask, do you have a problem? Bring it. If I solve it, ask me what biogeometry is all about. Mm -hmm. If I don't solve it, just tell me go home. You know, <laughs> this is it. But yeah. biogeometry is here for practical solutions. Mm -hmm. And imagine when we are speaking about all those things we're speaking about, but we have the ability to show it straight away with the results. Mm -hmm. So we don't enter into theorizing or philosophy yeah. or whatever. Th yeah. This is not our field. You, yeah. you, you know, I'm an engineer. What we do is practical. And the ancient civilizations, you know, there's one thing. When we uh, look at ancient civilizations, we, try, we look at their symbols, at their things and all that, and we try always to look at them in a symbolic way, using modern philosophy and modern psychology mm. in a symbolic way. What we don't know, those people had no time for philosophy and psychology and symbolism. Mm -hmm. Those people were doing practical things. Mm -hmm. So when they did a symbol, you should ask yourself, is this a device? And mm -hmm. what does this device do? But we tend to go, this represents that and represents that. No, they had, they had no time to represent things. Mm -hmm. They only did practical things in their lives. So every symbol that they did, every word, everything they did was practical. And if we understand that, then we will understand how great those civilizations were. Unfortunately, we tend to look, go into symbolism and uh, things like that and think magic and think all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll never understand the ancient sciences if we keep thinking that way. Mm -hmm. When one of our listeners um, um, is so fascinated about uh, this uh, sharing of uh, information and, and practical uh, knowledge uh, um, and says, I would like to, um, uh, to try it out or to, to use it in my university campus. What would you suggest would be the first step? Uh, where to start? Uh, what to do? Well, first of all is let us convince the administration of the university that we would like to make uh, a research project for three months. Now, this research project for three months would be free of charge. It's just a research project that we are doing for ourselves. Mm. And in this case, I will bring for this project, I will bring uh, enough shapes, geometrical shapes, and all that. I'll bring all the tools needed for our pilot project, let's say, for three months. And then we put the, the solution, and then we will have a questionnaire. Mm -hmm. The questionnaire will be done before and after we put our solution. So we'll take the questionnaire. There will be a group of students who know how to uh, uh, use questionnaires in a very neutral way, not to try to influence people. Mm -hmm. And they will go and pick, let's say, uh, 50 or 100 students, different, mm -hmm. whatever. And they ask them in the question, fill in the questionnaire about everything, about their health, about their way of thinking, about everything, their happiness, their aggression, their feeling, everything. And then we will have also questionnaires for some of the professors observing what's happening. Mm -hmm. And they will have questionnaires with all the problems. Then we do our work. And after three months, we go and they will do the same questionnaire again, observing, showing the difference. Now, if they see that we have really made a difference in that university, 
then we can sit, make a conference, sit, explain what we did, and talk, and then think of how to apply a total solution to the university where they will pay our fees. The yeah. first solution will be uh, a simplified solution so, so that it doesn't cost us a lot. Yeah. Maybe we decide to take part of the university or something. Yeah. We'll design the product according to the size and all that. We'll design it. But I'm ready to bring my team and sort of make a pilot project with the university. Uh, and we'll see what happens afterwards because it would be a very good uh, assessment. I mean, here in my universities, uh, in Egypt, and I also did with the uh, university in Vienna and all that. I did lots of masters and doctor's degrees, but we didn't do the buildings of the university. Exactly, that's I what, mean, yeah. Yes, the status of biogeometry, we have a very good academical status mm -hmm. with many universities now for 20 years, but we didn't do the buildings. We, we just did the research projects. Yeah. Maybe it's time we go and do the building of the university to show uh, what we can do towards the future uh, of, of the people. Exactly. And I, I would ex uh, expand it a little bit that not only the buildings in the, in the way of uh, physical environment, but also the digital and the social yes. part. Uh, yes, of course, yes. And so the whole uh, uh, set, uh, the whole ecosystem, um, yeah, that would be really, uh, really something. And uh, thank you for your offer. I, um, I'm sure we are going to do this in the near future. Because, you, you, you know, Rene, you, uh, it's like you caught me, you put me in a corner. Because you sp when you speak about universities, we're speaking about, about the future of the world. Exactly. These are our children that will lead into the future. And even if we do just one university, not more, yeah. this university will be like a light beacon that with time will pull the others behind it. Actually, so uh, it's uh, a very good idea what you're indeed, saying. And, and, and those students are, are not average uh, uh, human beings. Uh, they, they will uh, come on very uh, influential posts in, in uh, yes. later life. So and they, you know, here, uh, you would university would not be building just uh, people who know a lot about a certain specialization. Yes. No, they will build people who actually uh, are more human mm. because mm. we are going to change the way they think. Mm. This, the problem uh, of specialized studies is with time, you specialize more and more and more. Mm -hmm. So you start to think, I know everything about some very little aspect. Mm -hmm. And then you have a huge ego, mm -hmm. but in a very limited field, and you don't see anything outside it. Mm -hmm. But when you open those people to a much bigger dimension, what happens is they will feel more human. Yeah, even their egos will get smaller. They'll feel more human. They will feel that now they, they interact with others with pleasure. You know this yeah. interaction with people, this peaceful interaction, this happy interaction, not closed by uh, a scientific ego that puts them yeah. uh, in a certain pedestal. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, uh, I, um, the way I see it is more that uh, we don't. Uh, 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 put something, uh, take something away. We just bring things back into harmony. Uh, yes. So it is. I and you. Comp I just wrote an article um, about architecture as a symphony of form. So yes, playing with the fr frozen music uh, uh, idea. Yes. Um, that uh, bringing it back into harmony in uh, all the components is just like uh, when you go to a classical uh, concert. Just the yeah. first three minutes is noise uh, when they are uh, uh, tuning their instruments. But when the conductor comes and they have the music score, then all of a sudden it's harmony because this, it's coordinated. Yes. So that's how I see uh, such an uh, ecosystem as a university. When you bring it back into harmony because you tune into that higher frequency 
uh, the music score. And there is a yes. uh, uh, conductor who uh, says, okay, now uh, we play together. You know, uh, what we could do is, after we do the first pilot project, then we take the different departments of the university and make one a project with each department. For example, the architectural students will design the ideal university with by geometry. Mm. Even if it will never be built, but they will design it. The others will design the furniture for such university. The others will design, compose the music for such university, like we have uh, the musical compositions, like the serious Odyssey that we have, uh, that, that energizing, that, that creates a lot of balance and all that. Mm. So every department will have like a side project creating a biogeometry environment through its specialty so that they at least even if they don't build this future university but at least they design mm -hmm. a utopian idea university even if it's kept in textbooks mm -hmm. at least they've done it mm -hmm. and it will always be in the universal mind mm -hmm. exactly so I'm so grateful for your uh, time and your explanation, and uh, especially I'm with happy. <laughs> and I'm with happy to be with you. We've gone two hours now. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, what shall I say? Uh, um, when I start a new topic, we uh, add another hour. So let me close off uh, up that um, by thanking you really, really, very, very much. That um, thank you, Rene, and. Uh, Hope to see you soon sometime. Yeah, okay. Okay, well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.